Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this presentation on USD Husk procedurals in render time procedurals in Karma. My name is Fuad Yuxel, and I'm part of the effects team at uh, Rise Visual Effects Studios. Let's first have a look at uh, our recent work and the showreel and the recent projects that we've worked on. I think there were some hiccups in the playback. I just realized, uh, sorry about that. Um, so the agenda for today um, and what I'm gonna talk about is um, we look at render time procedurals. First, we're gonna start with the general over overview and look what they are. And then we'll look into Husk procedurals that are currently available in Houdini and Karma. And then we'll have a deeper look into hair procedural and invoke graphs. And then also look at um, dictionary arrays in, in Houdini and then finally have a very short overview over the ocean procedural and see the similarities between those. This talk is going to mainly be about hair and fur and character effects, but um, yeah, again, it's, it's more about the under the hood uh, technology a little bit. So um, everything, before I start the presentation, I want to mention the team and the people at RISE who contributed or still contribute to the development of all these creature effects work that we do there. So it's Lea, Jonas, Luca, Lisa, and Simon. And also all the images and uh, production asset room work that I'm gonna show today is, um, was done and created by Lea. So I'm just sitting, presenting this stuff. Um, so what are render time procedurals in general in CG? It's um, this is a short recap. So that's just geometry that's being created on render time. Um, and this is done by algorithms applied during this uh, render time. And then based on the procedural rules and parameters, the render engine generates the data and on demand. And a very well-known example, for example, that you all know is a 
subdivision surface uh, displacement sorry of uh, surface displacement where geometry is being subdivided dynamically at um, runtime so um, Obviously, the main advantage is simply resource efficiency. You reduce storage, which can be a very important and huge factor in, in VFX production or any production. So for example, when usually working on many shots across multiple sequences, a pre-frame cache file size can become very huge. And it, of course, also helps uh, reduce I.O. in SIM times. And then it makes uh, also efficient use of uh, memory. And obviously, it increases the viewport performance and the feedback while you're working with the asset. So for example, in the case of this grooming asset that I'm going to show, the lowest guide count for uh, which we interacted with in the viewport was like, I don't know, I think 40,000 curves, something like that, while the rendered high-risk version was up to 4 million in the end, I guess, something like that. So you immediately see the benefits. There's only one small or slight disadvantage that it is a bit non-interactive since you have a bit of a delayed visual feedback of what you're working with and of the final result. But then there's something called USD preview procedurals in Karma, which of course help with that, which we will have a look at uh, in, in a minute. So yeah. Uh, currently there are these four USD Husk procedurals available in Karma, Lops, Solaris. So that's the hair procedural that was introduced with 19.5. And then we have the ocean procedural. And then uh, since 18.5, I think, uh, was the RBD destruction lob. And then also with the recent release of Houdini 20, there's the feather procedural. We will look at the hair procedural mainly and then have, again, like I said, a small outlook into the ocean procedural. Um, and then for this preview or the faster feedback that I just mentioned, there's these preview procedural lobs for interactively previewing your stuff in the viewport and, and rendering them already in, in Karma and see what you get. So uh, let's look at the hair procedural a little bit and dive inside and see what it does. So here on the right side, you can see the parameters when you launch the lob and, and create it and place it into your node tree. And now we will have a look at each of those and see what they do and um, how they can be used actually in typical production workflow. So the node itself comes with two different modes. First is the generate mode and then there's the deform mode. The first one, the generate, uh, it just creates, or not just, but it creates static high-risk curves based on already existing low-risk uh, guide curves. So that's basically what the hair generates up node does, if you know that from the uh, subs. And this can be used for asset creature work as well as like static environment, for example, like grass or moss or any kind of vegetation that you could think of. And the other mode is the deform mode, uh, which deforms existing static high-risk render curves on one frame based on animated or deforming or even simulated guide curves and the deforming skin geometry like the character or the asset itself. And that's typically what you would do in CFX with animated characters or assets. And the nice thing is that you can, again, do deformation on top of simulation. There are some attributes and primvars required for that to work properly, which I wrote down here. And uh, basically, it's, it's like the deform mode is more like a wrapper of the hair generate sub and the guide deform sub in one with a little bit more advanced features, which we have, will have a look. But this is the basic core uh, of it. Um, then the next parameters are the actual UC prims uh, that the hair procedural needs, generates, and uh, works with. Uh, first one being the procedural primitive, which actually is an empty UC primitive that's being populated on render at render time uh, with the high-risk render curves. And then um, we, we have the, the guide curves, which are, like I mentioned, the, the low-risk curves. Uh, they're usually coming from SOPs or the already roomed model itself, LOPs. And then there's the skin primitive, which is the asset itself, the character, which is the mesh geometry that's, that holds all that um, guide curves. And the, uh, uh, sorry, the, and then the high-risk curves that are being generated on, on it at uh, render time. So Let's have a look at the, uh, the lob itself in, in production. So here's an actual production screenshot. On the left, uh, on screen left, um, you can see the low-risk guide curves that our artist Lea had groomed and created. And on the right is an early stage temp version of the high-risk render curves, which we created with this 
technique. So what you see is on the left is uh, actually what you would uh, write out the disk and what you would interact with in the viewport. These, I think it was 40,000. And then the other one is about 3 million or 4 million, I don't know. And um, the hierarchy and the UC primitive, the, the node tree is very, like, this is the minimal version of it. I reduced it to a bare minimum here to only show what's actually relevant or needed. So this is what you have in the USD stage node network. Um, let's have a look at that in, uh, in action. So in comes the asset, the, the layer, the, the asset itself. There's a light, and then you merge in the guide room, and then you apply the Houdini procedural, assign some materials, and then render it in the viewport. So let's have a look. This is the asset, and a simple dome light, and then in comes the groom. And then you can tumble around in the viewport. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then you get uh, you apply the Houdini hair procedural with all the parameters that's needed. Again, the procedural prim, the guide curves, and the screen prim. And then uh, hair over, uh, gener um, generation overrides, and then materials. And in the end, it's the Houdini preview procedural. And if you switch that to Karma actually, and let it initialize for a second. And then you get the iris render curves. And this right now is, I think, I believe, yeah, three million in total, uh, compared to the forty thousand which were coming in from the guides. And then again, you can tumble around. So I will let that run for a second before we will have a look at the procedural UC primitive itself and how it does look under the hood a little bit. All right, so uh, this husk procedural UC primitive, what, what is it? Like, it's, it's just an empty prim, right? But what does that mean? What does it have? And which parameters are available on an empty prim? So um, I, husk, by the way, um, the name husk is a command line utility for rendering uh, any USD file. Or for any Hydra render delegate. In this case, we're looking at Karma, obviously. So the Husk procedural primitive um, uh, is the one we're going to look at now. And screen left, you can see the path to the empty prim. And on the right, there's this uh, available parameters that come with it. And uh, now let's have a look, a closer look at the prim vars in the middle. So because Obviously, they give us the most important information about the USD primitive itself, basically all the information that we need. So in the middle, highlighted in green, there's, uh, for example, a value called hair generate uh, hair count with a value of uh, this uh, 3 million, which I just mentioned. And then and the value comes from the right screen right, um, which is basically the user value, which you just um, type in. And uh, where it says generation and number of hair, that's the total hair count, right? So. And these are, again, the, the user overrides that then effectively change your primitive at render time. And above that, you have these two primvars called procedural arcs and procedural paths in, in, uh, path in the middle. And we will have a closer look on these. And um, because those two are actually the interesting ones that uh, built the ground for everything to work and make the pro procedural what it actually is. Um, we're going to look at them, and then if you look at the lower one of those, it says invoke graph.py, and this sounds very interesting. Um, and this is the invoke graphs that we're going to talk about, because these are the building blocks or the main foundation of this uh, whole systems. And we will look at the functionality and the concept behind. Um, so. But first, let's have a, a look at one of its companions, which uh, builds the foundation of the invoke graph SOP. And that's the attribute from Palm SOP. So this node actually turns all the parameters in the node that you used to from working with Houdini uh, into a dictionary array with some key value pairs and uh, writes that into a detail attribute. So for example, when you expect it, all the palms available on the torus are being written into this dictionary detail attribute, like radius, scale, transform, whatever you have on the right. So 
And since this is just Houdini attributes, we can change or set or just or even overwrite them to our needs. So either with a wrangle or with a sub node. And one of those sub nodes is the attribute adjust tick sub, for example. Let's see that in action. So here is a torus with some uniform scale of one. And now I change this value. And you can inspect the, the geometry spreadsheet where you really can see the, the values being changed. But obviously, this doesn't affect the geometry because it's coming from upstream. How would it? So again, this repeats now a torus. And then attribute from palm turns it into this detail attribute with all the parameters, dictionary. Uh, array and then you change the values and you can watch these happen in real time in on the spreadsheet. But of course you want to change it, right? So there's a way to actually override those parameters and detail attributes afterwards and have that to change and effectively change the geometry. So um, and the nice thing is you can um, change that to any arbitrary geometry which is coming in, and this is even more interesting. So this is where the spare inputs and the parameter over, overrides, which you can see on the right side, uh, come into play. Let's see this in action. So here I'm just linking the attribute I just ticked up with the spare input of a newly created torus. And now when we change the scale and the attributes, they take effect. So hence you're just overriding the detail attribute coming from the attribute from palmsop. And the one node which actually does this all for us in a much more interesting and procedural many, uh, manner sorry, is the next node um, we're going to look at, which is the invoke compiled graph sub, which was introduced with Houdini 19. The documentation says processes its inputs using operations defined by a geometry graph. But the documentation also says the usefulness of this node is very, very esoteric. And I think that's an understatement. You should re re I would rephrase that so this is one of the most powerful concepts in Houdini out there. So, and this sentence makes it really interesting to have a deeper look, I think. So, um, yes. So what it does, actually, it invokes or calls parameters from a subgraph. And this graph can be one single node, as in this example, but it can also be many nodes, like a whole node network. So the attribute, so, uh, attribute from PalmSoft that we just saw in action turns the box geometry, in this case, into one single point, including the parameters needed to describe the node, kind of like a recipe for the node, so to speak. And then downstream, the invoke graph reads this graph information and <laughs> recreates this geometry on the fly. This is so cool. And then the next step, of course, is then to invoke a whole graph instead of only one single torus or box node. So, but in order to do so, there's one important thing to, to know here. The nodes have to be encompassed inside a compile block. This is where the name invoke compile graph comes from, I guess. So the comp compile block wraps the whole tree into actually kind of one node. And you can see that also when you inspect the performance monitor while cooking. And this is ideally multi-threaded, so it comes with some gain in performance as well, which is great. And si since no, each node does not have to hold a copy of the data coming in from upstream in the memory, this is where the performance comes in. And then it only holds the information of what the node actually does with the geometry. So here, for example, it just first subdivides and then transforms the incoming geo. And again, that attribute from Parm uh, turns it into a dictionary. Uh, um, the detail uh, attribute. And then this graph can then be written to disk. So with this graph, then your node network is actually converted to a real but abstract form of Houdini geometry. And then each node is being turned into one single point, and each node connection are represented by lines. And each node parameters are stored as those key value pairs that I mentioned. And very important here is the node must be compilable if you want to use it in the compile block. And they're also referred to as verbs or verbified nodes. And um, non-compilable nodes, as, uh, as I show here, um, 
have this batch you can immediately recognize by this uh, batch which I made extra large to see for the time shift node for example um, but th that's only a few like I think up to now it's, it's 95 percent or so or something like of all subs have been already verbified and uh, hence can be uh, used in those uh, compiled blocks so here's a short summary for of the steps again from this workflow for this workflow um, so you write your node graph dictionary to a native Houdini BGO file and basically save this recipe of the node graph to disk. And then you read it back, invoke this graph recipe with the invoke graph sub, and this way it loads the recipe from that disk file, from the BGO file, and then you apply that graph to any arbitrary geometry afterwards, and then you can overwrite that dictionary parameters. And uh, for those who worked with uh, Apex so far, uh, they might know this invoke workflow since it's also used heavily in the new Apex uh, rigging workflows and uh, framework. And that's what we're going to, what I'm going to show now and what I'm showing <laughs> here. Uh, so you write that out as a BGU and then read it back from disk and invoke it. And all node operations from inside the block here, like for example, the subdivide and the transform node now become a recipe for the whole structure and then can be applied to any arbitrary geometry. And then, um, and please note that there's no absolute or ni live node connection here between the lower part of the network after the read node and the upper part. So they're separate and um, totally independent. So uh, let's have a look. So here's the compile block with the subdivide and the transform. And then it turns that attribute from Parm, turns it into this dictionary that I just uh, mentioned. And now you ha even have that geometry graph representation in the viewport. So now watch what happens if I move around the nodes. So this is turning the, the nodes into a point <laughs> and the connections into lines. <laughs> this is not esoteric, this is cool. <laughs> so, um, and then you read it back in, apply the graph, and here I just apply it to a box, but of course you could apply it to a torus, and then it gets subdivided, and then even to a Utah teapot, and then it gets subdivided and transformed. Or you can merge those, and all of them are being, I mean, the torus, ob obviously, uh, the, the platonic obviously wouldn't be subdivided since it's a subdivision surface, NURBS, uh, NURBS surface mesh. But um, the, the uh, basic principle, I think, comes, comes over here quite clearly, I hope. So, yeah, I repeat that once again. So here you can see that it's completely disconnected now. And then you just invoke it and apply it to the, the operations to the graph. Uh, to the geometry, sorry. All right, so now let's see what the other node inputs, input connections can do of this node. So they are called inputs, but they actually also really represent the inputs of the compiled block of the graph that they operate on. So. Um, these inputs can also do overwrite parameters. So here, for example, I'm reading in the graph again, applying it to the torus, and then with a wrangle and a few lines of VEX code, I'm overriding the parameters. I think it's a scale, subdivision, depth, and rotation, yes, with a few lines of, of code. And then you can, or must, in, in this case, use spare inputs again in order to make these palms overridable. So I will leave this slide open now, and, and you can see yourself how the uh, spare input is uh, linked to the, to the node coming from the, the right side, and then you have this dotted line and see how it's connected. So this is the transform, this is subdivide, and then both are just uh, spare input linked with the uh, right input. And uh, since a few versions now, VEX includes uh, as a dictionary data type. So you can create, manipulate, and um, access dictionary arrays via code, via VEX directly. And the syntax is quite straightforward. The general form is uh, as I show here. It's dict and then parentheses, key, and then you type in the value. So the VEX type is dict and the syntax is d at name. And in order to, to change the value of an index in that array, you can do, for example, d at Parms and then in parentheses uh, Parm name and then just apl apply your value that you want to. So, for example, for rotation or override the scale with this um, uh, with this with this code. So let's see this in action as well. Mm. 
I'm here I'm changing the um, the scale and the rotation and all the like the subdivision of uh, those different geometries. So you just apply any kind of geometry and then apply the operations. So, and uh, while playing around with this and doing some testing in R&D, what I found out that is you can even chain multiple invoke graph subs. So, kind of similar to a for loop, you can iterate over an arbitrary amount of elements and just return the result. And now when you overwrite the palms again, then it takes effect for the whole loop, basically. So now, but everything that I just showed and that we saw now can be done via pre-render script as well. And this is exactly what the Husk care procedural, and I believe also the other procedurals, um, do under the hood. So the uh, setting up the graph that's connected, uh, that, that's going to be invoked, sorry, and then you read the inputs, and then you read and overwrite the palms, and create the geometry, or the primitive, and then uh, run a pre-render script, and uh, actually before rendering the final image. So let's dive inside the hair procedural now and learn from the developers. So there's a lot node called define and set up hair procedural prim, and this is where all the magic happens. On screen right, you can see all the palms. And in the lower section, there's a Python source. And if, we, if we're going to inspect the code a little bit now. And in it, there's everything defined. So for example, the procedural prim, as well as the graph that's being created, and the inputs. And these things are the building blocks of the whole invoke graph workflow that we just uh, looked at. And this is where it all comes then together in the end. So um, here's the procedural prim and the hair graph. This is all on the Python script blob. And then there's this block of parameters, which are the, actually the user overrides, so to speak. And then, um, for example, the total hair count, the hair length multipliers, and the width scale and, and whatnot. And uh, if you look at the Python source, the code itself, uh, you can do that and, and read it if, if you want to. But I just highlighted a few parts of it uh, in green. These are the input prims that come in from the right upper side that you can see, the guide curves and the skin mesh. The red part is uh, where uh, which defines and builds the procedural prim, which is the empty procedural primitive, and where the high-risk curves are being generated onto at render time. And then it uses the USD geometry, uh, USD geom module and the basis curve schema in, in USD. You can all look that up in the USD documentations. And then the purple block is, uh, this is where all the um, parameter overrides, the override palms are defined. And finally, in white, the Houdini hair procedural graph that is then being invoked by the script on render time. And there's, uh, in this primvars, you can see that this uh, hair procedural path and the Python script called invoke graph. And, um, you can find that script in your Houdini installation folder and have a look. I will show the path in a second. And um, this is where it, it, you can find that. That's the path to the location of that script. If you want to uh, have a look and type inside. And this is actually the, the Python script that's being then called before render time. I hope I said that correctly now. So, and then here again is a summary of the steps included to execute and render that procedural. So, Husk basically traverses the whole hierarchy, the whole stage, and then it looks up and finds all the primitive with this Houdini procedural API schema applied, and then it applies the overrides and runs the Python pre-render script at render time. And uh, this is the case for both the Houdini preview procedural as well as the UC render op. And in case you have a UC render op downstream, then this uh, Houdini preview procedural is being uh, bypassed. 
on render time. And um, and that one is actually, if you look at the parameters that are what just mentioned, uh, the Houdini procedural API schema uh, is what I show up here in the, that, that's, there's nothing to, to set or change there. And um, now, as promised, there's another procedural that I'd like to show really, like very briefly. And this is more like a short overview and also a little bit to see the similarities between both of these uh, procedurals, even if they cover completely different areas. One is grooming and fur and the other one is ocean. But uh, it's about water and uh, its effects, so it's cool. And uh, it's the ocean procedural which was introduced with latest uh, Houdini 20, version 20.0. Um, so its main features or main workflow steps are you bake or write the ocean spectra as a BGSC file. Um, and then there's one cool feature which we will have a look at in a second is the camera frostum based surface subdivision or dicing. And then you have some very nice and neat uh, viewport overrides for faster viewport feedback which help a lot for interactively working with the ocean and then uh, then you have different things like spectrum resolution, downsampling, dicing quality, shading, and foam, all of them as uh, user inputs and overrides. So let's have a look at this. And uh, you will see immediately that the structure is quite similar to the one before. And these are the parameters. So again, there's the procedural prim and the graph on the upper right. And then the user overrides in the middle. And then again, the Python source code where all the magic happens in the end. And um, if you look at this code, it's again quite, it looks quite similar to the one before. And uh, you again have the inputs, the overrides, and finally the Houdini procedural API calls and the path to that graph. But there's also one very ni uh, nice thing about this new node, which is again the first and base dicing of the surface. Let's see that. in. Action. So uh, on the right, uh, you can see tile patterns. Actually, I didn't mess around too much with the settings, but uh, yeah, this is the rendering out of Karma. And then on the left, you can see the viewport representation, the wires. And just to get a context, so the camera is placed um, far screen left, and then the dark area in this wires is actually the camera for some subdivided area. And um, I think that's uh, almost it. So before I finish this. Let's have a quick look at that and see that in motion. So this is the rendering on the right. And then you can see when I change the camera, the viewport, uh, the, the, the camera angle, then the, the um, subdivision of this, this geometry, the surface uh, is being changed accordingly. And then you have this viewport quality, which is really cool, where you can change the resolution. One would be the native resolution, and then I think I use 0 0.2 of 0. Uh, uh, 0 0.05 here to really lower the resolution, the, 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 the resolution representation of the ocean to have faster feedback. But once you put it to one, then you have a really high risk uh, ocean surface geometry, like the, the full spectrum. Here it's 0 0.2, and it's all already looking cool, but you can go up to one, of course. And then you have the materials and everything else. So I think that concludes my talk for today. And uh, yeah, that was a um, this was the two Husk procedurals and hopefully some insights into in, insights into them. And if you want to read and learn more about these things, um, there are two fantastic presentations I want to recommend here. One is uh, Jeff Late's masterclass on compiled SOPs, and the other one is by Stephen Lavietes. I hope I spelled that correctly now um, on generative hydro procedurals. And I converted both to QR codes. So if you want to scan them, go ahead. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Hey, um, have you tried using the invoke graph concept on other things than the already existing procedural setups that are there, like motion and hair and so on? Have you tried to? reuse that, filling it with data to get something that was not intended? Have you experimented in this direction? With the invoke graph sub, you mean? Yeah, like that is used in USD. Because that sounds interesting to me to also you know, create anything on the fly. 
uh, geometry wise no i didn't but i think you could you could right mm -hmm, yeah. yeah of course but yeah. there was no need yet for for you to try that. i didn't do that right no okay yeah. cool <laughs> other questions yeah lovely presentation love love all the detail Thank uh you. totally agree that the invoke graphs are not just like a side feature it's like a back of the box yeah. um what procedurals are you kind of excited about exploring next like where would you see this applied um because kind of other areas in the work that you do at rise to be honest i think and hope there will be more coming and i think procedurals are in general be getting bigger and more like a focused topic to be honest and i i could even imagine thinking of other areas where they could be like developed for crowds top of my list i have no idea about this yeah it seems possible but i like i don't know it just maybe it seems like you could do the deformation and then generate the crowd people for at, example at time. yeah but what you just mentioned yeah i don't know but maybe yes cool <laughs> but they're in general i think they're getting bigger bigger and more, more focused on so that's going to be a topic definitely for the future and we're looking into this, of course, yeah. Other questions? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much, Fuad. You're welcome. <laughs>